the parent early on is kind of a prosthetic orbital medial prefrontal cortex. And the way in which the child has to adapt to the parent, in a sense, becomes kind of the architecture of this hierarchical system. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Therapist Uncensored. This is a podcast that breaks down interpersonal science into practical and understandable tidbits. And as you listen, I can just imagine little light bulbs of insight appearing above your head. Absolutely. You're going to be surprised and touched at what you learn about yourself as you get more accurate and in-depth view of your mind and your heart, and as you figure out those close to you. Therapist Uncensored brings you decades of experience with interpersonal psychotherapy, relational neuroscience, modern attachment, and anything else they think will be helpful in healing humans. Now, here are your co-hosts, Dr. Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. We are very pleased to bring you a guest that we've actually had on before, but we loved him so much. And he has done some really cool new stuff that we are bringing him back on. Uh, Our guest today is Dr. Lou Cozzolino. And if you bring in the two concepts of psychotherapy as a process of learning and changing and growing with the client, or we might say on this podcast, it's not just psychotherapy, but close interpersonal relationships do the same thing. We are learning how to update our models of relationship and change and grow. That in combination with neuroscience, so neuroscience being the study of the mind and how we learn and how our brain changes. And basically, Dr. Cozzolino is very interested in bringing those two aspects together. So for all you neuro nerds out there, well, I know that you're going to really appreciate this and love this because he gets into some of the sciencey part. If you're not a neuro nerd, if you don't identify as that, it's cool. Just hang in because this can apply to everybody and it's great information. So without further ado, we bring you Dr. Cozzolino. So welcome back to the show, Lou Cozzolino. Thank you. I have seen this term neurofluency, and I was curious for you to just begin right there at the concept of neurofluency. Well, I think the thing that I've noticed that is the development of this idea that there's a neuropsychotherapy. It's obvious from the neuroscience data that one form of therapy is superior to another, and it seems like there are a cottage industry has grown up of people creating different forms of therapy with different sets of initials that are based on, you know, rewiring the brain and all of that. And I think what I tried to think about in the term neurofluency was how do we use our knowledge of the brain not to recreate the wheel and create some new form of therapy, which really are all old forms of therapy that get retreaded, right? Right. To think in terms more like, for example, what does cultural awareness do for us, right? There isn't really cultural psychotherapy. What there is is psychotherapy that is expanded and deepened by an awareness of different cultures and also how different people experience life and words and relationships in different ways. So for me, cultural awareness expands and deepens and increases the potential generalizability of therapy to more populations, hopefully. So when I think about neurofluency, I think about a different stream of thought from some kind of neuropsychotherapy. But thinking in terms of how does the therapist, whether you're a CBT therapist or whatever, Rogerian, Gestalt, whatever it is, your family systems, how do you become fluent in with using and understanding how the brain is structured and functions, and how do you add that into your conceptualization and treatment plan? So the book I'm working on now is called Neurofluency, and what I'm really trying to do is to educate people sort of like the backstory, the important basic component parts of science that I believe a therapist should know and be aware of and add to their thinking and help them coordinate and maybe integrate in some meaningful way different forms of treatment as opposed to being a devotee of one form of treatment and sort of like if you've got a hammer, everything's a nail. Yes. But actually try to think about who the person is and what forms of therapy might be most helpful and also challenge yourself to develop a scientifically organized eclecticism. I love that. And I particularly love the eclecticism that you're talking about. I know some of your background is quite diverse, pastoral counseling, psychology, neuroscience, 
it seems that your career is really blending these and being able to empower, whether it be therapists or actually parents or what have you, if we know what the key ingredients are to build integration, because what we would normally talk about is secure functioning or earn secure functioning, or what I prefer to say is earning secure functioning, because it's such a long-term process. But in neuroscience terms, what's the goal? What, how would you articulate that? Well, I think looking at attachment and the things you're describing from a neuroscientific perspective, I would think in terms of how do we impact those hierarchical circuits, for example, between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala for affect regulation on the one hand. And another focus would be how do we build the polyvagal system to enhance interaction and interpersonal success, right? To be able to know how to use other people, how do you approach and how do you connect because attachment isn't just a, a cognitive schema. It's a sensory, motor, visceral, somatic, social experience, cultural experience. That's the perspective that I would take. And so it could be that for a particular child, a soccer coach might be a better secure attachment figure than what they have available at home. For some of the kids I've worked with who have had like early severe neglect or been institutionalized and those sorts of things, I found that dogs are incredible right? So what gets activated, see the biochemistry and the neuroanatomy are kind of the levelers. It's like what we're trying to do is impact these networks and these systems that we're learning. And for every given child, it might be completely different what they feel safe with, what they can approach and what will work with them. So I'm really thinking, you know, I'm trying to get past, you know, in my training, you had to sort of like sign an oath to be loyal to whatever your charismatic professor was, Yes. And only think about things and do things the way de they did. And I really would like to think of psychotherapy in the future as moving towards less of a, a religious devotee model and more towards a scientifically informed practitioner. Because there's just too much available to us now to make believe that the information isn't there. Of course, with all of these professional schools churning out thousands and thousands of therapists, there's very little quality control. The world is flooded with therapists. And so, of course, therapists that are looking just to make money or looking to do something when the real estate market is slow, whatever they're doing, right, they're going to latch on to something that's simplistic and that they can comprehend and that they can sell to people. We really do have an obligation to the consumer, to the public, to up our game and to begin again to monitor the quality of the, of the professionals around us because that's been long since let go. I love that challenge. I think that that is great, but it's both a challenge, but it's also preserving everyone finding their own niche and what feels right to them. So they're not just doing a technique that it really has to be embodied by the therapist, but there's also the challenge of, yeah, but, but do it at this basic level, at least like at least have this neurofluency to be able to know why it is that the change is happening and what kind of change you actually you're looking for. You know, and I think, for example, for me, cultural fluency is just as important. You know, another thing that's, that's often neglected these days, but just as important too, is the mental health of the therapist and their own attachment, of awareness, mm -hmm. whether they've been through therapy. So many therapists I run into now have never been in therapy. I don't mean to elevate neuroscience. Neuroscience just happens to be one of my interests. I don't want it to be another religion that people think, oh, we've got to follow Lou because, you know, this is the way. It's like, I don't want a new form of therapy. The ones we have really work well. I mean, if you, between CBT and object relations therapy, Rogerian therapy, those family systems, the things that we've developed or have been developed by our, you know, predecessors are really good. And you can't just add the term amygdala on one of them and then call it neuroscience. It's basic uh, therapy. Yeah, I've heard you talk, though, about what are those basic ingredients that you want to see in the therapy? Well, I think that, you know, the core piece for me is the relationship. I think at the heart of all psychotherapy should be Carl Rogers or some version of him, right? That what he discovered without any real information or knowledge about the brain, as he discovered the optimal human conditions for neuroplasticity. You know, the basic tenets of, of Rogerian therapy optimize affect regulation, neuroplastic growth, and neural growth hormones, all of these things. I got to work with Carl Rogers when I was in school, and I've watched a lot, any film I can find of him, is that what he does is he creates an environment where your defenses are no longer necessary. I was just thinking it's all about safety. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Which carries right through the core of all of our trauma treatment, 
I mean, I think the only trauma treatment that I've seen that really is qualitatively different is EMDR because it's tapping into a different set of mechanisms. So it has value in a different way than most of the other forms of therapy. But for the most part, the center of every therapy is the relationship. And that leads to the next point where you have to be safe in order to have affect regulation. And you have to have affect regulation in order to not have your cortical systems inhibited. And if your cortical systems are active, then you can actually add new information to the system and develop new narratives and new way of thinking and all of that. And so, you know, all of the different forms of therapy are important, but like CBT, for instance, I think that one of the things that certainly thought definitely can influence emotion, but I think that more primitively, affect regulation, that's the horse that pulls the cart. And you can use thinking to help regulate your affect. But if you're not regulated and you're in therapy and you're, you're not really changing, in my view, you're simply learning a language from the therapist and you learn how to talk about being healthy, but you don't necessarily change. <laughs> That's great. So some of the key ingredients that you're looking for, the safe relationship, co-regulation or the capacity to regulate, and that comes from the safety was there anything else that you had in mind around those key ingredients? Related to that, I think each form of therapy needs to have a kind of balance or discover a balance of affect and cognition, right? And it might just be that because our hemispheres have differentiated so much and they're easily dissociable, that all of us will have a bias towards one type of processing or another. So I think a lot of what goes on in therapy is simultaneous activation or alternating activation of those two basic functions. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it sort of, uh, you know, going to trauma therapy. I was trained by so many people that believe you get through trauma simply by catharsis. Right. You keep expressing the emotion, expressing the emotion. And in my experience, that doesn't really help anyone. In fact, it it's only seems negative. And mm -hmm. so if you don't add anything new, if you don't add cortical activation, then there's no real neuroplasticity and there's no real change. There's a hundred ways to do that. But you have to have both of those things. So, right. So if you're thinking too much and, you know, that can be a problem. And then if we're throwing clients or spouses or whoever into dysregulation and it's just about that, neither one of those are going to produce change. But when you have an integration of both where that you can begin to have words and speak to what your somatic experience is or what your internal experience is, that's what you're saying. That is going to actually make I would say, right, physical change and neurological change. We would assume that's the case. I don't think we have data for that, but we would assume that's the case. You mentioned EMDR. Just any quick thoughts about that and that, that form of treatment? I was always interested in EMDR. You know, I had like a love-hate relationship with a, for a long time mm -hmm. because it seemed too simplistic. And the fact that there were no theories that really explained it to my satisfaction, I worried that it was simply sort of like a cult thing, like, a, you know, another cult movement. So eventually I took the training just because I wanted to you know, sort of get to the bottom of it for myself. And then, if, then I experienced it and I realized there's something happening there. And so, but then I can't just rest with that. I have to figure out what's going on. So I, I basically read everything I could and talked to my old physiology teachers and tried to figure this out. And I think I got to an explanation that I find satisfactory. It's a working hypothesis, you know, but it can always be tested, you know, and I'm glad to change if it seems wrong. But I think what happens is that we have this thing called a salient circuit that's involved in the insula and the anterior cingulate, and the system becomes activated when we confront something novel, right? So what it does is it activates our system, our, our new learning systems, our hippocampus, you know, the temporal lobes and those sorts of things. And it seems like from my reading of the literature is that what happens in, in PTSD is that novel experiences don't trigger the salient circuit. It actually triggers autobiographical memory. So then what happens is then I think this is probably the underlying biological reason for neophobia. Neophobia? Neophobia, the fear of something new. Okay. Yeah. Well. <laughs> DSM symptoms of, uh, of PTSD. Yes, yes, yes. Is that so there's an avoidance of things that are new because you don't want to upset the apple cart because new things aren't experienced as new. They're experienced as old traumatic things. And so I think what EMDR does is it taps into a more primitive system of salience. So before we develop the salient circuit, in more primitive animals, there's the orienting response. 
right? Right. So I think what's happening, and I think the reason why it doesn't matter whether you use eye movements or touch or whatever sounds, what you're trying to signal is the orienting response. Because primitively, the orienting response is orga- it's organized within old systems of memory updating. And that's why, like, when we're in REM sleep, our eyes move, even though there's nothing to look at. So it's sort of like that squirrel, you know, the dog is talking, and then there's a squirrel, and then they all orient, squirrel, and then they come back. That's my life. (laughs) I think what you figured out, or accidentally discovered, is that it's almost like a prosthetic. If you're traumatized and your salient circuit doesn't work, you can tap into your orienting response and actually update some memory circuits with present experience. So, again... I don't know if that's true. I certainly wouldn't take that to the bank, but it's the only explanation that I can think of that is in line with the research literature and that explains the phenomena and ties it to REM sleep and doesn't just settle with that because the right hemisphere, left hemisphere integration, I don't think that's it. The system is much more complicated than just hemispheric laterality. Right. Yeah. When we talk about integration, exactly. Sometimes we talk about right, left. We talk about bottom, top, top, bottom, but it has gotten more complex. I've heard you talk about, you know, we used to just think of the prefrontal cortex or the orbifrontal cortex as the boss. (laughs) And that now the most recent thing I heard that you speak about was that we actually have three executive systems, not just cortical. So would you mind saying a little bit more about that? Yeah. I mean, I think that the amygdala is the structure that we share it's sort of, to me, the pivot point of the brain. I always, I think of the amygdala really as the kind of, yeah, everything, everything sort of pivots on that. It's the fulcrum. And it's also, it's, uh, it's the primitive executive. So before animals developed a huge cortex, we had the amygdala. And the amygdala is an organ of appraisal. And it's, a, you know, what's good, what's bad? What do we approach? What do we avoid? And it has all of these connections to the brain stem that activates fight, flight, freeze responses and all of these things. And so that's the first executive. I actually started thinking this way when I was working as a corporate consultant and thinking about what executives are successful and which aren't. And for the most part, executives that don't have a well-regulated amygdala don't do very well. And it's mostly a lack of social intelligence or even of their own, you know, just their own ability to navigate the difficulties and the stress of the job and plus relationships. So that's, I think, the first executive, the most primitive one. The next one that evolved, I think, is the frontal, and the one that most people think about executive functioning is the uh, frontal parietal networks within the brain. Think about the brain navigating the world. The brain has to coordinate behavior in time and space to do all of the different things we need to do to survive, to get the food, you know, to, to procreate, to escape from danger and all of that. And so the frontal parietal executive system, the frontal lobes, are organized to process the sense of time. Parietal lobe it evolved out of the hippocampus, so it's sort of a spatial map in, at multiple levels. And so the parietal frontal executive system organizes our experience of space-time and also our ability to navigate it, right? And then I would say the third executive system is this uh, more newly discovered uh, called the default mode network, which has to do with self-awareness and empathy with other people. What I've been doing in my business practice really is working with people that are coaching others, for example, is that I talk about the development, the awareness and the development of these three systems. And so what you want to do is figure out where your strengths and weaknesses are and kind of build up your strengths in one of these three networks. So there's a system that you mentioned that keeps you cool under fire. Is that right? Well, cool under fire is that reflects a system that has been integrated well with cortical processing. And that really is the same system as the attachment system. So of the neural networks that you've mentioned so far, what is the system that is most associated with the attachment system? Well, the amygdala system. The amygdala in and of itself, without the cortical connectivity, right, is just this reflexive fight-flight system. So if you've got a child that's insecurely attached, they might crawl into a ball or the insecure one might not let go of their parent or whatever it is. So what you're looking at is, in a sense, not an immature amygdala because the amygdala is mature before we're born, right? It really is the networks that regulate and inhibit it that get built during attachment. And those are descending networks from the orbital medial areas of the prefrontal cortex. Then one way to describe what we are seeing with attachment, would you say, is that the infant uses the parent or the caregiver to regulate their own affect. Is that kind of what you mean? The parent early on is kind of a prosthetic orbital medial prefrontal cortex. 
and the way in which the child has to adapt to the parent, in a sense, becomes kind of the architecture of this hierarchical system. Right. So is there research that shows the interaction between the robust attachment research and the research on the inside of our minds, the little nuggets inside of there, the brain? I can be completely wrong about this because I haven't really focused on the attachment research per se, the neuroscience research for a number of years now. But I remember when I was writing that my first book, The Neuroscience of Psychotherapy, what I needed to do was to look at the research on how the cortex and the amygdala interact with each other, what are those systems, and develop a number of parallaxes that, in a sense, you know, allowed me to construct a theory about it. And I think, excuse me, Alan Shore's work is pretty much of the same. We looked at a lot of the same information. It's a theory that I have a lot of confidence in. I, you know, it's, everything's a probability statement. But I would suspect that what, you know, what, what is happening, I'd be really surprised if it wasn't increased cortical descending activation. Because, you know, for example, you know, when you're born, you have a grasp reflex, the palmer reflex. And after three or four months, that goes away. And if you become demented 60 or 70 years later, that reflex returns. And the reason it returns is because the neurons that originally were inhibiting that reflex start to die, and then the reflex returns. And so if you look at the general strategy that evolution has used and conserved over during evolution from sea slugs up to humans, you see what it, what it has to deal with is the patterns of excitation and inhibition. So with the amygdala, the amygdala is all about reflexive reaction. In order to regulate the activation of the amygdala, it doesn't really have the internal mechanisms to do that. What it relies on is its relationship with the orbital medial prefrontal cortex to modulate and regulate it. And then when you think about later evolution, as we got more and more social, that's where I think something, the polyvagal theory or something like the polyvagal theory, which adds a kind of volume control to arousal as opposed to just having this on-off switch based on sympathetic or parasympathetic arousal. And you see the gradual ability of critters of all kinds to stay in proximity to when they get angry, they modulate their reaction based on the proximity of children or gender differences and all of those things. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm, I'm thinking of someone like Ruth Lanius or someone like people like that who have been working really focused on the attachment piece and brain piece. So I wouldn't be surprised if she's come up with something, you know, or someone in that elk. I just haven't kept up specifically with that area of research. I learned that I find solid theories are preferable now to new research data, you know, because I think if you come up with theories that make sense based on the history of the fields, that you can come up with things that over time research continues to reinforce. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you follow the latest findings on a website from Scientific American or Time Magazine or whatever, you get pulled hither and, and yon trying to keep up with all of these things, and it's hard to remember them all. And so I think developing like a coherent theory of how the brain functions and how affect regulation and attachment and relationships and neuroplasticity, how all of these things work together, gives you a really solid foundation or maybe like a skeleton on which you can either apply or ignore the, the new study of the day. Yes. How many of us have gone to a workshop and came back to our practice with just a little bit of different style? You know, like we're, we're trying on a technique or we focus on the particular issue that we studied that weekend. So I totally get what you mean. And solid theory grounded in history and that has been consistent over time is really good. But speaking of history, I think I read that you said that Freud may have inhibited his own interest in the brain, even though he was a neuroscientist, until after he died. Is that a fair attribution? And can you say more about that? Something about a scientific psychology, I'm blocking on the first words of it, but he wrote it in the late 1800s, and it wasn't published until 1953 with the complete works, which is when, after he passed away. And, you know, my suspicion was, I mean, and in, in that paper, which is a really interesting, it's a monograph, and he drew little diagrams of what defense mechanisms might look like if you map them onto neural circuits and things like that. You've got to remember, he was a neurology resident when he was working with Charcot in Paris. And so the real question was, you know, what's the relationship between the brain and mind? 
how is it that someone who has done something shameful might get glove paralysis, which doesn't make any sense given the way the actual meridians of the nerves work. So I think the reason why he repressed that was, I think he had enough on his plate developing a new form of science, Mm. right? And that would, in a sense, to also question neurology by trying to unreduce it to the brain would have been probably too much controversy or trouble for himself. That's my guess. And he was also a young, you know, a young person and he was trying to make money and be successful. So you don't want to be seen like too much of a nut when you start. (laughs) That being true, then you, you want to stick to a solid theory. That paper really ties it back. You know, neuroscience speculated by Freud because he didn't have a microscope. It is, you know, back to the basics, basically, psychological theory. So that's pretty amazing. You know, having gone through school during the 70s and 80s, and I had to sort of read Freud surreptitiously because, you know, it was sort of like through the feminist anti-whatever movement. And so Freud was an idiot because he was a coke addict and a misogynist and all of this stuff. So, yeah, I mean, all those things might be true, but you don't want to throw out what was there. And most of what we do is based on what he explored anyway. And so, you know, the question is, what's there and what's of value? And the thing that I like most about Freud was, if you look at a lot of his work, is he wasn't making the distinction between mind and brain. He didn't have enough brain knowledge, and I don't know if we do either, but he certainly had a lot less than we do. So he was using metaphoric language of mind. He was creating almost like a mythology of what goes on in our brain based on the fact that he was so influenced by Darwin and, you know, believed that our ancestors not only monkeys and apes, but also the, our primitive ancestors before civilization, in quotes, created a lot of our psychic structure and also our psychic stress. So what, what's the superego? You know, what's the voice of the ancestors? It's the voice of the parents. What's all the shame about? Shame is about social organization. When you don't have language, how do we choose an alpha? Well, you make everybody else ashamed of themselves and look to other people for what's right, and you've got social organization. He was uh, much smarter, I think, than he's been given credit for, at least in the last 50 years or so. You know, he's been thrown out, and people are trying to do modern psychoanalysis without him. There's a saying that you've got to get right with Freud. (laughs) But I really like tying it all the way back, you know, to the father of psychoanalysis, to blend neuropsychological technique and uh, therapy. So that's cool. So one of our websites says, neuroplasticity, get some. (laughs) Can you say a bit about what your perspective of neuroplasticity is? And also, what are the conditions that promote it? I love Dan Siegel's definition of the brain, which, you know, it's like a, it's a, what is it, a matrix of energy and information? You know, that is a much better way to think about what it really is. And William James also, you know, in thinking about the brain and plasticity, he said something to the effect that the brain has to be rigid enough for memory and to sustain us through time, and it has to be flexible enough to adapt. So there's a, if you take both of those concepts together and you think, okay, here is an information system that needs to have sort of reproducibility, but also has to be an open system that's open to new information and change. And maybe a good way to define trauma is that system becomes closed and someone gets locked into old ways or, or stereotyped ways of being. And so when you think about the neurochemistry and the neuroanatomy of plasticity, you know, what we find is that the biochemistry, neurotransmitters, neurohormones, neurogrowth hormones, all of these different things, they basically are are sort of low and dormant when we're not stimulated. When we're at low levels of stimulation, low to moderate levels, something you might call curiosity, interest, exploration, something like that, all of that biochemistry and fluidity, plasticity of the brain is optimized. When you start to become stressed or when adrenaline gets too high, when cortisol gets too high, all of those things, what you see is a shutdown of plasticity. And so the secret of change in both in the classroom and in therapy, and maybe even in politics, is that people have to feel safe enough to change, right? They have to feel safe enough to think. And when people, and you know, Karl Rove and the Republican Party figured this out years ago, it's like you create an enemy and then you terrify people. So either it's the axis of evil or it's a caravan of Middle Eastern terrorists walking through Tijuana. I mean, whatever you make up, people don't have any, any other source of information. So if you scare them enough, they'll pretty much believe whatever you tell them. And so there's a rigidity 
in that. And I'm not saying liberals aren't, you know, rigid in their own way, right? They're also limited and they're sort of married to some principles that are just wacky. So I'm not taking sides here. I think both conservatives and liberals are important as part of the biodiversity within the species because we have to both be compassionate and protect our boundaries, right? So there's that part of it. Again, that basic conservation principle and evolution is excitation and inhibition, reaching out and putting up boundaries. And also psychological health is the same way. You connect with people, but you've got to have boundaries. Otherwise, you become ill. You know, when I think about plasticity, I think about that sweet spot of arousal and safety, the combination of all of that. And especially in learning, being curious and exploring. Because if you look in the animal research, you can't really add, you can measure an animal's cortisol and stuff, but you can pretty much tell if an animal is anxious by their lack of exploration right? They hide or they stay still when they're anxious. And so I think maybe you can put that to uh, metaphorically to our brains, right? When we're frightened, we become stupid or become rigid or however you want to say it. You know, you referenced the alpha. When people are inducing fear on purpose, we want a strong leader. You know, we will follow the leader, become submissive, do the inhibitory actions. Everyone should read 1984 about every five years to remember what unconscious negative systems or, you know, capitalism without morals, like where all of that stuff takes people. And we're all vulnerable because most people are looking for answers. Mm -hmm. Right. And if there's somebody that's very assertive and dominant and and giving the answers, it's easy to get people to pull. And that's actually, it's funny because that's how you started the episode, which was in questioning kind of blind following a charismatic leader, even of therapy or of a technique or anything like that. So that certainly fits together. You talked about that, how much he distrusted systematizers. Uh, Nietzsche, Frederick Nietzsche. Oh. Whenever I see a psychotherapy manual, I always get a little shiver. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Because it's so easy. Because then we don't have to think and we can just reference and follow versus really doing that more deliberate, active cortical work, you know, it's kind of like you can get on a freeway and it's easy and you just follow versus, you know, you're on these country roads and you have to look at the map and turn it upside down and really kind of sort it out for yourself. The way to sell lectures and books and tapes and all of those things is to sort of do the kind of the Deepak Chopra thing. You say things in ways that make people feel good and they're not going to pay too close attention to the details because if they do, they're not going to be happy with what they're learning, right? Mm -hmm. I like to think of myself as someone who annoys people into thinking, you know, or like, like if this, are these your assumptions, then let's question these assumptions. So Mm -hmm. it's more uh, maybe uh, Socratic. I'm more Socratic, which makes me unpopular with a lot of people in the university who just want to know what's on the test. (laughs) I bet. So uh, another just quick question that I, I imagine Given, again, the neuroscience, what are your thoughts about face-to-face therapy, about touch therapy, somatic therapy, about lying on the couch and being behind the person? Do you have a sense of where you would guide people with what you know? Besides the fact that everybody's got to kind of find their own theory, but to produce this change. I think that most likely the principle, I think it could have, like I've heard uh, Bessel van der Kolk talk about this, safety is... The most important, that's the, that's the core principle. And people experience safety in every possible way imaginable. And so I think that instead of having a way to do therapy or a format that you insist on, to learn from your client where they need to be to be in that sweet spot of safety and arousal, that's where the work is. I mean, I'm thinking about when I worked in the hospital system, I went into a room, you know, I came in on Monday morning and the nurses told me, hey, you've got to meet client in room 10, you know, go say hi to him or whatever, and you're going to have to meet with him today. So I went in there and I didn't see anybody, so I came back out and I said, are you sure he's in his room? Oh, yeah, he's in there, you can find him. So he was under the bed, right, eventually. I found him under the bed. And so we did our first few sessions under the bed, right? And it's because he had delusions about monsters chasing him. And for some reason, he felt from when he was a little kid that under the bed was safe. And so I had to negotiate getting under there with him and starting there. And eventually we got out from under the bed. So none of my training ever told me to get under the bed with a client. They told me not to get in a bed with a client, but they never told me not to get under a bed with a client. So I felt I was safe there, right? And I think, but that's it. It's that flexibility. It's the ability to use 
animal assisted therapy. It's the ability to, to realize you're not the be all and end all, especially with kids. They probably need to be out in the sun and playing soccer or doing something, you know, or, or being in the wilderness that might be more helpful to them. So I think it's just, it's learning how to think, right? And understanding the basic principles of plasticity make you realize that there's no one strategy because every human is an experiment in nature. And it's up to you as a clinician to figure out how to help them re-regulate and help them change in positive ways. Well, this is awesome and it is uh, so useful. So if you had three bullet points or a few bullet points that you really wanted people, because we've covered a lot, if you really want them to walk away and really understand, what would you want to convey? First one would be there are no set answers and don't believe anyone who's telling you them, right? So that would be number one. (laughs) Number two might be that at least I believe that the brain is a, it's a social organ of adaptation. And if you think about it as an organ like the pancreas or the liver, you're going to miss a lot. And so I think that you've got to look at everything. You've got to look, you know, bio, psycho, social, cultural, developmental. You have to have a very broad view and broad conceptualization. And then the third thing I would say is you have to get in touch with your own flexibility and your, you have to be able as a therapist to tolerate the anxiety of your own ignorance in order to join into an experimental relationship with a client and figure out together. This is sort of related to that. When I teach a class, I don't assume that the wisdom is in my head and that they're just here to suck it all in because I learn every class I teach, I learn something from someone in the class. So I always, you know, I always teach my classes in a circle and I always say the mind is in the middle of us right? We're all connected via these spokes, you know, and like that. So we're all one. So please don't inhibit yourself. Say what's on your mind, ask the questions. And I do the same thing with my clients. I mean, I think of it as, you know, we have a partnership and exploration and I'm very open with my own limitations and my own, you know, my own neuroses and uncertainties. And I try not to make the therapy about me, but I try to communicate that enough to where the person doesn't feel there is this hierarchical relationship. So maybe that's the holdover from the feminist psychotherapy professors that I had. It just seems like a better perspective to me. And all my, all the work, I read all those papers from the Stone Center at Wellesley. (laughs) They're all in my head still. Good, good. Well, I love that. You know, I'm a group therapist and and my version of that is that the group as a whole knows more than any individual person. So that if we can tap into that gestalt of the group as a whole, it's pretty safe. That's a pretty safe place to go. The same thing when you're working with in a business. So it's like someone brings me in as a consultant. How does the business improve? It improves by, you know, trying to get rid of some of the silos developing a culture of feedback and communication and support and realize that the human factors are a big part in what makes a group of people successful in any business. Right. So you want to capitalize that and, and get people talking hive mind basically versus inhibiting, you know, the more patriarchal up down hierarchical. And one of my teachers uh, years ago was a fellow named EO Wilson. Who's, he developed the field of sociobiology and he spent his life studying ants and termites and bees oh. and stuff. And I think it really helped me to understand people, to understand ants. The way way a hive or a colony is organized and differentiates and supports each other made me see human behavior in a very different way. It really helped me to get out of being stuck in the individual mind as the unit of, of understanding and realize that everything we do is influenced by, you know, at in multiple levels. And I think in order to help people, we really have to understand as many of the ways they're influenced as possible and intervene in those things and change those things and create experiments and living where they get to experience themselves in different ways and different contexts and different situations. You know, you sound like a really good social worker. <laughs> I think social workers are probably the most simpatico group. They're the people I have least convincing, you know, of my position. That's where that's their epistemology. That's where they come from. Well, that's good. I'm a clinical social worker, proud of it. But it is true that I, I think that too, there's a real broad base that we come from. So I was actually, it was a compliment that you were sounding like a, a social worker, a clinical social worker. Well, this is fantastic. So if our listeners, I would love to actually keep going, but I'm aware of, I don't want to uh, hog your time. And by the way, Dr. Cosolino will be in Austin, Texas to talk about this in more detail. 
soon. We'll post that, of course, on our show notes. But can you let listeners know how to reach you? And also for our listeners, again, people very interested in this, neuro nerds, as we call them, or therapists, of all your books, you've got a million really good books, not a million, but a handful. Which ones do you think that they should start with that would be uh, best for them? Well, I think if you kind of want an introduction to my work, almost like the Reader's Digest version, I had a book that came out a couple of years ago called Why Therapy Works. And so I distilled in that book a lot of the key ideas that I go into a lot more detail in, in the neuroscience of psychotherapy and, you know, human relationships and those sorts of things. So I probably, that's where I would start. It's kind of like a, a poo-poo platter, a sampler. And then if you like it, you can look up the other books. Or maybe- <laughs> that's awesome. Well, we'll have a few of those linked in our show notes for sure. And I love that. That's actually been a guiding question of mine is like, what are we actually doing and how does change actually happen? So that's part of my interest. The other thing I I sort of thought of when you were talking is it's sort of like you're fighting. It's like (laughs) anti-narcissistic. Like you don't want to walk out of a session or of a consulting room where that everybody thinks you're fantastic. It doesn't sound like it sounds like you're really wanting to empower people to figure it out and to feel good themselves about the experience. And that's not totally common, but I really recognize it and really, really appreciate it. So what feeds into that is before I did my psych degree, I did a degree in philosophy and then in theology. And so I went from professor to professor to professor, each of whom was a believer in what they were teaching, and they couldn't stand how anyone else lived. So everybody was right. (laughs) Everyone is right, and no one would, would communicate with anyone else. And so one of the things I loved was getting to know the people that were down the hall from me that were doing incredibly interesting research, but I'd never meet them because academic programs are so atomized. And that's why I think, you know, social work probably is one of the more interdisciplinary or integrated sort of programs. But when you go, you know, especially people who study psychology or go to these MFT programs or, you know, all of these things. And it's often very much in the mode of education still that I received was that it's always sort of like a charisma battle. Mm-hmm. One of the things I like about science is that the data is the data. You know, you can disagree with me, but the data is the data. It's not false news. You may question the methodology so that you might not accept the data, but at least you've got something that's real to talk about. And you can argue about what the data means. And I think another thing, too, is that we all have brains And our brains are pretty paleolithic. I mean, they're not up to the modern world. And so we all suffer. We all are burdened with shame. We're all of information overload. And I like that perspective of having the relationship with a client where, you know, I know a little bit more than you do because I've studied certain things. But don't think that I'm going home and sitting in the lotus position and like God is is patting me on the head. It's like, no, I go home and I deal with the same baloney you have to deal with. And uh, this is my best thoughts today. And who knows what will happen tomorrow. (laughs) But it's a dynamic relationship. Well, one, you know, the interpersonal psychology that you were mentioning earlier, you know, it's it's that. But also, again, it's like very anti-shame that if it's like it's an active process of that we're in this together and we're all made of the same stuff. And, you know, it's not that special of how bad you feel about yourself. <laughs> yeah. And go back and go back to Rogers and watch him do therapy. And it's the same thing. And so I think, in other words, that psychotherapy hasn't been wasting its time for the last century waiting for brain discoveries. Right. We've developed really good forms of therapy without any knowledge of the brain, but all of the therapies, when the ones that have worked and the ones that have held on are all guided by the invisible hand of plasticity. Because if they didn't help people change, and I'm sure probably a million therapy have arisen and dropped away and gone extinct, right? But I think almost like we have too many therapies now because everybody who wants to make money develops a new therapy with a new set of letters. But really, every therapy I've ever seen or gone to conferences, except, like I said, EMDR, and there were some others, for the most part, they're just rewriting old forms of therapy. So I make students feel like they're overwhelmed with 10,000 forms of therapy, teach students the basic forms of therapy, and then use whatever they want to, or, you know, sort of as sidecars or techniques. There are a few basic strategies. Well, you know, and it also it invites creativity and individualism for each session, kind of like a learning the structure of how to cook versus like a specific recipe. And I, I might be guilty of this, so I don't know how hard I want to come down on these people because I might be one of them. But I don't think it's helpful 
when every theorist comes up with their own set of words and languages, you know, and language about things. I think that it's important to contribute to the movement of the field as a whole, not just presenting an alternative script. How does a field move forward if you just have little pods of people doing one thing or another? Especially if you're only repackaging your therapy because you want to sell it. I understand you want to make money, but I think that on the other hand, it doesn't really serve the growth of the field. Right, that you want to instead tie it into what is already there, and maybe you add a little nuance or a new way of thinking, but it's, it's not a split off par. So again, we are talking about integration. Yeah, I think that students now are probably much more confused than we used to be. That what they're getting are these uh, third or fourth repackaged generation therapies, and then they become a devotee. But it's kind of like the problem with education in general. They don't learn the history and they don't learn the basics. Mm-hmm. They're you know, a QXZ therapist and that's all they know. Technique oriented. And I think it's really unfortunate because it's lowering. It's like a race to the bottom. We're lowering the overall level of quality of people in the field. And we've mm-hmm. got consumers and that uh, depend on us. Right. That's exactly right. Well, and it's such a healthy thing for people to hear because it also puts it on the consumer or those of us seeking therapy or those folks out there seeking therapy to really kind of have a high standard about what you're looking for and to kind of know what change you want to, you know, whether it be, you know, that you know you overexcite and that you are preoccupied and that you're anxious and so that you know that you need particular integration in that area or the other way. So And it gives people a language to ask therapists about this. So I think it's very empowering for the consumer, actually, to hear this. So I love it. I love it. I love it. It's right for sure. I hope to see you and all of your listeners in Austin when I come. Absolutely. I hope so, too. You'll for sure see me. But, yeah, we will put this out and try to get more of our listeners here. And we are very fortunate. We're heard in 174 countries, if you can believe that. I didn't even know that there was that many countries. <laughs> so it's a little head scratching of like, oh my gosh, how? So there's people, there's a lot of people interested. And we're so excited to be able to bring it right to everybody in a totally accessible way. So now if any of those folks that we're talking about wanted to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to, is it a website or a, an address? Like I think I told you before, I don't, I'm not really good at marketing. But I do have an email address at Pepperdine University. So you can email me at lou.cosolino at pepperdine.edu. Or you can just go to the Pepperdine website and find your way to the faculty and get me that way. Okay, that's great. Well, I will see you shortly. And thank you so much again for your time. This is fantastic. I really, it's just action-packed in the uh, episode today. My pleasure. Thanks for putting up with me. (laughs) More than that, I loved it. It was fantastic. All right. Well, you take care. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening all the way through. We cannot end this podcast without a huge shout out and thank you to our folks that have uh, joined up for Patreon. And we're going to start with people that have uh, joined up at the $25 a month level. These are the co-executive producers of the show. We're going to start with someone named Anonymous. You have been awesome. And we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. Lori Aman. Thank you very much. And Amy Joyce, you guys are fantastic. We really appreciate it. Then at the gold neuro nerd level or kind of a super nerd level or however you call it, basically you're going to see their names on our website soon with a link to their website or, you know, page, whatever they want to link to. Both of these categories will do that. And let me just tell you really quickly that what I've heard is that a backlink on a larger website to your website, even if nobody ever clicks on your link, Google likes that very much and sees that as validating of your own website. So that is at the $10 and up a month level. But Lena Rhodes, who is our official number one fan and will always be, thank you very much for joining us. And also Kim Marie O'Driscoll. Thank you very much as well. That is awesome. How many times do I say awesome? You guys should count. (laughs) It's pretty terrible. But that's how happy we are. And in that vein, one of the things we have done is also added a category, a dollar to nine dollars a month. And we are so, so happy to be able to do that. Because then if anybody wants to give us a dollar a month, even if you value the material, if you share it, anything like that, Kathleen McCarthy, Teresa Tenney, Hannah Pate, P-A-T-E, and Catherine Antenberg. 
thank you very much. This is not everybody yet, but we are going to just uh, weave some of the names in that have really helped us. So we really appreciate it. If you would like to join as a Patreon member, we would absolutely value it. Patreon.com backslash Therapist Uncensored. We really mean it. If you value the material, if you value the guests, if you not value, it's not like a judgment statement, but more it's if you use it, if you've shared it, if you listen to it and gain something from it, then surely you can throw in a buck a month and hopefully more than that. At $10, like I said, you will get a link to your own page. And for those of you who have already joined, by the way, we are actively getting that lined up in our website. So you'll see that in a hot minute, (laughs) probably by the time this goes live. All right, you guys take care and thank you so much for listening. Subscribe if you haven't, rate us and review us. That costs nothing. (laughs) All right, we really appreciate you listening. So we will absolutely see you very shortly right around the bend. Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. This podcast is edited by Jack Anderson. Jack Anderson.